Thanks for that. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, this is Rita Ganes. I'm part of the EXEC, and we're really glad to be able to have the opportunity to come together and to share some of these conversations and dialogue that is so important. Uh, we really value all of you spending this time with us and uh, also the opportunity for you to become more interested in what we can offer as the organization as well as our various collaborative learning communities. Now, previously we used to be known as the SIGS and as of the last conference, uh, we moved over to and we started calling ourselves uh, collaborative learning communities. There are six communities and you would have experienced conversations and dialogues like this from uh, three previously. And uh, today we have three, um, sorry, I think it, it was two of them previously. And today we're very fortunate to have three of our CLCs come together and they form part of the student learning uh, collaborative communities. And uh, they will be presenting us with something that is really valued and really needed as we've move towards uh, the online space. Uh, initially, we were getting ready. Right now, some institutions have started, and the idea is around care and consideration. Um, but before we move on, I'd just like to welcome the community that is present today on the chat, that we also have as part of Altasa, the initiative around writing short pieces of your experiences or whatever your thoughts are right now. And so I invite all of you uh, to please consider writing a short piece towards uh, the SASA initiative. And uh, there's an opportunity for everybody to engage with that as well. So um, I really want to uh, say a big thank you to our three uh, student learning CLCs and uh, thank you for wanting to initiate this type of conversation which is really needed uh, in our national space right now. So thank you very much and back to you, Danny. Thank you, Rita. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. I see we're up at currently 108 participants. We've got about 170 registered for the event, so I'm sure more people will be joining us in due course. Uh, so today, we're, as Rita has intimated, we're focusing on care and connection. And we're looking at understanding the lived experiences of both staff and students during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, myself and six others are involved in today's webinar. And there you can see all of us. Uh, depending on who's talking at any given point, you will see their headshot up in the top right of the slide so you will get a sense of who's talking and when um, and so we are representing three collaborative learning communities uh, the first year experience foundation learning and tutoring and mentoring so just a couple of house rules if you if you don't mind before we get going uh, nicola has mentioned some of these so apologies for repetition but we do ask that everybody keeps their mics muted um, until later when we open up for more conversation with everyone. Uh, please also keep all your videos off uh, just to be fair to everyone and to conserve bandwidth. If as the presentations um, are happening, and I'll give you a rundown in just a moment of the format, but if as the presentations are, are going on, if you have a question you want to ask, please do feel free to type your question in the chat we are monitoring that and we will return to some questions um, once our presentations are done. There will also be a time, however, um, after each of us has presented, where we will open up the room to general conversation. So you've basically got two ways in which you can pose a question, either on the chat or if you want to contribute either via questions or answers in the open conversation section a little bit later. So the aims of today's webinar, we want to be able to recognize and acknowledge that really at this current moment, we as staff are living and working in a fundamentally different world and a fundamentally different space of higher education. It's also important that we recognize that our students are now living in a fundamentally different world and learning in a fundamentally different space of higher education. 
With that in mind, we want to highlight and promote Carol Gilligan's ethics of care and really what that means in this current moment and context where it demands that we privilege our connections and relationships with each other and with our students and that we practice care, concern and compassion, both with ourselves, with our colleagues and probably most importantly with our students. We also want this to be a space just to talk and reflect amongst all of ourselves. Uh, I'm sure many of us feel there hasn't been time really to connect with colleagues nationally. So this is an opportunity to do that and to provide some time to simply pause and breathe. Again, many of us feel there hasn't really been enough time to actually do that as we shift to emergency remote teaching. So now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Nelia, who is going to uh, start with the first of our brief presentations. Each of us who are involved in this webinar uh, will be speaking. And then, as I said, there will be a time where we open up the floor uh, to a conversation amongst all of us. And towards the end, I will bring the webinar to a close by keeping track of what's being said and uh, drawing together our thoughts around a few key themes. So, Nelia, over to you. Thanks, Danny. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the, the move to emergency remote teaching, there have been numerous publications that really share tips on how we should transform our learning spaces so that we can obviously effectively engage our students. Um, some of these have also highlighted the need that we need to be sensitive to the challenges that our students might face in trying to access um, ERT. And we know that some of these challenges include connectivity issues, no access to data, and the high cost of data. We've been made aware of these challenges from an academic perspective, but have we stopped to actually engage with our students and to really find out what their challenges are and what kind of support we, their lecturers and the institutions need to be providing them? I'd like to play you a clip from a student who highlights some of the obvious challenges that our students face and possible ways in which these can be addressed. Good morning, everyone. My name is Peño. I'm currently studying a master's degree in public finance. The challenges we are facing as students, especially during lockdown, First of all, it's access to portable devices such as um, iPad, tablets, and a laptop, so that we could be or we can have access in uh, to what the study material slides that the lecture upload. The second one is access to internet connection or Wi-Fi. Um, as a student went home during the lockdown, some are staying in a rural area where the Wi-Fi connection is bad or it's difficult to access 4G or 3G. We are still using 2G or 1G, which is can be very slow uh, to download or to have access to uh, university blackboard, university portal. The other reason is access to printing. For module like math, they send us question papers where we have to print them and solve the problem, then upload them. So if I'm at home, I don't have access to 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 printing, uh, and I cannot scan the the solution after I'm done with the uh, the 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 homework or the question they give to us. And then the last uh, problem we are facing is time constraint time constraint if they give us a um a quiz or an online test that is open for two hours or uh, one hour it's difficult for some of us to do it because uh, if there's an internet connection or there's poor uh, internet connection that's it's going to be difficult for students to keep up with time of uh, finishing the the task that was sent there so if the university can provide us with access to devices, internet connection, or Wi-Fi, or data, and then uh, the time, they must expand the time, maybe for an online test or a quiz should be open for the whole week so that everyone could be able to do it. Thank you very much. 
This student has confirmed some of what we already knew, which is, as we have said, that many of our students will have challenges with access to devices, access to data and internet connectivity or Wi-Fi. What we may not have considered, however, are factors such as no printing and scanning facilities and issues with time limits when answering and submitting assignments and tests. The reality is that many of our institutions have tried to address these challenges by providing data to students, devices and working to zero rate some of the learning management systems that our students have to access. So what can we do? We can start by being cognizant of how we engage with self and others and remember that our well-being and the well-being of our students is intrinsically linked to how we show care, communicate and connect with one another. I'm now going to hand over to Zina. Thank you, Nia. Thank you, Nia. Good Thank morning, you. everyone. My name is Penyo. I'm currently studying oh, a master's oh, degree oh. in public finance. Technology, 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 the challenges. And the basic science always work with us. Sorry, I'm not sure why. Okay, sorry, guys. Some technical issue. Yeah. Okay, I'm just muting all quickly. Uh, and then, Zena, you can you can turn on your mic again. Can you all hear me? Oh gosh, there's an echo on my side. Okay, there's a lot of feedback on your side. Um, do you perhaps have a phone uh, nearby to your computer? You might um, want to move, move the phone. No, but I think no, but that I'm, I'm not the only of class. Apologies. Try now, Zina. No, I, 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 Can everyone hear me? Can hear me? No, we're still there. getting feedback. Yeah, I see you're, yeah. you're on here with two devices. Can you pick one maybe? Um, which is which is the one, Dina Cupido? Which is that one? That's a phone. Um, yeah, no, you can remove no, no, that no, one, please. Tina, you logged in twice. No, I don't know why, because okay. I've only logged in <laughs> once today. Well, I've moved, removed your the Zena Cupido one, so now you should be fine. Sounds yeah. Yeah, it's much better. Go for it, Zena. Sounds good. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. We can hear you, or I can hear you, Zena. This is Danny. Hi, it's it's perfect now. Would you like me to go on to the Would next one and you? come back to you, Zena? Hello? We can hear you, Zena. Yeah, let's do that, Danny. Okay, I'll go on to the next one. Advanced Diploma and Business. Sue, if you don't mind, you're up. Okay, good afternoon, colleagues. I think um, a great way to begin this slide on care and compassion is to remember that our students are not studying from home, but in actual fact, our students are at home during a lockdown trying to study. I think the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives forever. It has taken us out of our comfort zone. And as an initial response, I think it has brought us into a panic and fear zone. Let's listen to one of our students' personal experience of learning during COVID-19. This has affected me badly since we have loads of work to cover under such circumstances and the time is going. I'm starting to get anxious. This leaves me with thousands of questions. 
if what's going to happen when we recommence with our studies, are we going to be given tests and some lots of work again on top? And I'm starting to forget everything that I've learned before lockdown in our lecture halls. Again, what's going to happen to our qualifications the same? Is the academic year going to be cancelled? Are we going to repeat S1 again? This is really affecting, affecting in such a way that you can start to think otherwise about school. Having thoughts of giving up. As you can hear, colleagues, this student's fears, anxiety, uncertainty, and concerns are not unique or unrealistic. These are thoughts and feelings experienced by most academics and students. This panic has forced us as academics to pause and reflect on our practice. It has given us an, a much needed time to learn from the situation that surrounds us while also unlearning some of our traditional ways of teaching <clears throat> and then to relearn new ways of doing and engaging with our students. The pandemic has certainly give us, given us an opportunity to rethink our teaching and learning in a more caring and compassionate way. We have decided to highlight five ways in which you can bring care and compassion into your teaching. Firstly, care for yourself. This is the number one priority. For you to show care and compassion to your students and colleagues, you need to be physically, emotionally, and spiritually in a healthy space. Keeping in touch during this time of lockdown and social distancing is important for our well-being. We need to communicate with each other, keep in touch with our students and colleagues, especially the most vulnerable, isolated, and needy students. You know, colleagues, we are no Wonder Woman or Superman. We need to be realistic about what we can do and what we cannot do in our modules. We need to keep it simple, clear, and concise. Fourthly, showing kindness and support to colleagues and students is so cru crucial during this time. They could be going through a difficult time, maybe lost loved ones, lost their jobs, their homes, or even suffering from the illness. We need to show kindness and support during this time. And we should also be willing to give and receive care and compassion. Finally, I think we need to bring the pan pandemic discussions into our classrooms. It should be infused in our lessons, connecting our students with our realities, and hopefully help to flatten the curve. I now will hand you over to Francois from University of Free State to continue the discussion on care and support. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sue. I appreciate This has affected me badly. Hello? Go, Francois. Should I continue, Danny? Go for it, Francois, we can hear you. Um, colleagues, um, in terms of my contribution, uh, uh, let us focus on a few, a few minutes on some of the most significant challenges students experience in online learning. Uh, many students lack a stable environment and study space at home, uh, especially our students from townships and remote rural areas. Um, they also experience uh, that families do not uh, do, are not sensitive for the, um, the the fact that they have to study and they have to spend much time on their studies and then another thing study materials are not available and many do not have textbooks with them they they didn't realize that they should take it uh, with them when lockdown was announced at some institutions students do not have access to electronic library resources um, and then to ease student and lecturer stress, institutions maybe they must try their utmost best to, to provide uh, electronic means for students to access various platforms, especially online classes, uh, data bundles for your journal access and downloading of ebooks, additional time online, especially for extended curriculum program students, 
Several colleagues uh, mentioned that they experienced best feedback and collaboration via WhatsApp groups with structured themes and questions to be attended to. And the students also experience a feeling of connectivity and uh, they feel close, more close to each other. And then care and emotional support communicated by lecturers contribute to relief, anxiety and stress of students. Um, Sue also mentioned uh, this, uh, students appreciated when they hear, don't worry, you will not fail. Are you okay? How can I help you? Um, this contribute quite a lot if they experience this kind of communication to ease their stress and uh, anxiety. Uh, in cases where students only have cell phone access, they should be allowed to take pictures of written work and then mail it to the lecturers. Um, colleagues, here's a, a law student contribution that, uh, that I would like to conclude the, my contribution and then I will hand over to, to Tayori. Thank you so much. I am a third year law student. Um, the biggest challenge for me during the lockdown with regards to online learning is a stable environment to be able to concentrate and study in. Um, there's always surrounding noise. Also, I don't have all my study material with me, so it is hard to make ends meet academically with information that I need, but don't have. Lecturers only provide information to some point and expect us to have the rest when it's not realistic. I don't have all the textbooks that requires me to complete these tasks and when I'm on campus that is not a problem because I can go to the library but now I can't. Um, what I think the institutions could do differently um, to ease the stress of the students is that they can provide electronic means for us to access such a pro a platform. They could do that by providing the students with data vouchers. Um, they could give the students access to journal article sites, um, which usually require subscription. Um, and they can also give students access to sites um, that allows them to download ebooks for those who don't have textbook at hand. Um, or they could just allow us back to school <laughs> where we will be able to have access to all of the above. I am a third year law student. Um, Thank you, Francois, the for that contribution. Challenge I'm actually for... just going to go back to uh, Zina because she's now ready to present. So, Zina, um, over to you. Thank you. Uh, if you could play the clip for me, please. Sure. advanced diploma in business and information management i think the biggest challenges we are facing with regards to the lockdown and online learning is the fact that we we don't all have access to internet connection and apart from the internet connection not all of us have access to phones that are advanced um that can that we can do online learning through besides the phones we also don't have laptops not all of us have have laptops and even if we do have a laptop, we don't have data to access the, the online learning platforms. And most students that registered late are not in contact with the lecturers because apparently I don't think they're on the system of the, the lecturer's systems. So they're not getting the information that they need from the lecturers. They almost as if they regard it almost as if they're not registered. I don't know if I'm making any sense. I think my, my my suggestion would be allowing students to come back to residences so they can have um, Wi-Fi connection, Wi-Fi connection, so they can do their online assessments that are required. If not, then you can negotiate with um, negotiate with the, the the service providers, internet service providers, to make it zero rated. Which at the moment they're saying it's zero rated, but it's not. It's actually not. But I still feel as if it won't 
online learning won't be a good solution to to all students most students are going to fail because most students come to tut because they want to study they they want to see a lecturer in front of them in order to um interact with the lecturer so if now we're studying through online learning not all of us are going to understand not all of us are going to pass it's going to be a challenge um i think i don't think it's a good idea i just think things should i don't know department of higher education should just open the institutes okay thank you very much um so we hear from students here and we 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 get the sense of the very real challenges that they face um but also that fear and anxiety and the yearning to want to return to what's normal and um, so that we can get back to the business of, of learning. But we know that that's not possible. So we have to ask ourselves is what can we do to support students who feel this way? Um, how do we connect and engage with students in ways that acknowledges those fears? Um, recently, I came across the work of Ravage and she developed what she refers to as a flux pedagogy and she describes this pedagogy as an emergency uh, sorry as an emergent design um, a humanizing approach to teaching which is both adaptive and generative but more importantly compassionate and she suggests the following currently i think both staff and students and i see um, um, participants in the chat referring to staff and students and others I think we're all experiencing a collective trauma and Ravage encourages us to, to learn from trauma-informed pedagogy, which recognizes how individuals are impacted by personal and generational history of harm in order to build awareness and promote learning. So we all have been affected in different ways, but it's important to be caring in our approach. Um, and that could be simple things like when we start our classes, to begin with a warm check-in and emphasizing again the need for self-care for both staff and students. Um, she reflects on the need for an emergent, de uh, emergent design. I think if there's one thing that we've experienced and like was my experience this morning in trying to get on, is that things can go wrong um, and often things do go wrong. Um, and so we find ourselves in new territory, um, but more important is that as we engage with students, that we actively listen to what they have to say. Um, we listen to their ideas. We learn to co-create through this process. Uh, also, in doing so, we recognize that students are agentic and are active participants in their learning. And so, like Freya, she encourages us to work from a space of hope and love. And then lastly, she refers um, to a brave space pedagogy where we find ways to communicate and engage with each other authentically and to acknowledge the discomfort that we all may be experiencing in order to find ways of how to move forward together. Thank you. So I'd like to hand over to Tauri. This has affected me badly since we have loads of Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my uh, slide specifically looks at connection, creating connection. So when the year began, we were in our higher education institution environments. We were a, there were opportunities to connect and build relationships with our students and our and our peers. But now with COVID nineteen. We face barriers and challenges of connecting through lockdown, social distancing, and the, pre the eminent threat of COVID-19. We need to rethink the ways in which we connect with our students and our peers. Maybe technology can help by using possible collaborative tools, things like an email, a Google form. It could possibly be a hello, how are you? How are you doing today? Are you fine? Let's think of ways of finding ways to reaching out to our students and our staff to show that we care 
and we, as we learn to connect remotely. So the next student voice you will hear is a student that is finding it difficult to be at home. Listen to her voice and think, how can we reach out and connect with her to show our support and our care during this time? Danny, please play the clip. I'm a second year um, computer science student. Okay. My biggest challenge during this lockdown with regards to online learning is the fact that I'm unable to consult with my lecturers like face to face and I am a person that's having a problem with change. So this whole thing happened like all at once and so I get anxiety attacks and I can't even move and go anywhere because my learning space is my room and it's my chilling space so everything is just in one room i can't even breathe and yeah and i have internet connection problems i don't have data it's it's just a lot and um i think that Insta Tyree? I'm finished, Danny can go to the next. Oh, you're done, okay. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. So thank you to Nelia, Francois, Zina, Sue, and Tyuri for those contributions. Uh, what we're going to do now is, um, hopefully as the student clips were playing, you had a time to reflect both on what students are uh, expressing and, and sharing. I'm a second year um, computer science student. Okay. My biggest. Um, as well as what's going on in your own spaces, depending on where you are and what you do at your institution. So we want to open up the webinar for a general conversation now. Um, I'm going to check in with Artie in just a moment, who's been uh, monitoring the chat. But what we ask at this point is that if you want to say something, please type an M in the chat uh, window. Uh, to show us that you'd like to take the mic um, and we will then uh, call upon you to um, share your contributions. But before we do that, or as we're talking, feel free to type an M so that we know you want to say something. Uh, Artie, I wanted to check in with you in terms of questions that were coming through and uh, themes that you were noticing. Uh, thank you, Danny. Actually, um, there's a lot of comments that have come through on our chat group and a lot of it shows uh, the challenges that we're going through and it's highlighting that the challenges are not just faced by students, but also by staff and uh, we tended to rush through um, in our way forward in trying to address um, and, and, and save this year and um, it did leave a lot of people um, feeling stressed, uh, demotivated. Um, and there's, aside from that, there were a number of other challenges such as, I think a student has mentioned um, something about breaks in electricity. I think we all face uh, something like that. Um, exposing students to dangers by getting them to go and purchase data if need be, access to devices. Um, there, there are a number of uh, challenges, Danny, that have been mentioned. I would actually um, suggest that these can be elaborated by our participants. So if you do wish to address any of these issues, um, can we suggest that you type in an M and we can start in this conversation? So, anybody have something they want to contribute? Something that resonates? Something that's uh, sitting heavy on your heart, perhaps? Um, Nicola. Thank you, Danny. I think there's a lot of mention about devices and data, um, but I just wonder how ready students and staff are, you know, in terms of that students actually, our realization that students need more, need more than this that support extends beyond these things so something that we've picked up is in our support uh, for students is often they don't have the apps on their phone 
to open the documents that are in the uh, uh, learning management system. So something like as simple as a PDF viewing app um, or something that can read those PowerPoints. Uh, I'm talking now about the students who are using mobile phones. So even though all our students have phones and we think that they can use it for learning, there are still um, other barriers which are maybe more uh, digit related to digital literacies. Um, I'm not sure if other folks are experiencing similar things. Anybody who are, anybody else who's in the room have something that they want to say in response to Nicola? I think something that um, has been cropping up in the in the chat as well is the data usage. Um, that living online is now taking an impact on the, the amount of data that we have to use. And I've noticed that uh, there were suggestions of using things like WhatsApp and suggestions as to some pros, some cons as to how to use WhatsApp. And then there's a question of using Microsoft Teams. Um, so maybe we can pose this on the outside and find out uh, what is, what do people use? Um, what works best for them? Mm, yeah, good point. You know, the, the link might not necessarily be um, intuitive, but if we come back to what one of our grounding principles are, which is about showing care, sticking to low tech is showing care. It is also a means of managing expectations, I think, because we can't be developing courses that require huge amounts of data or huge amounts of bandwidth for students to actually be able to engage fully. So taking the principal decision to actually keep things low tech to ensure that as many students as possible, at least on that score, are able to participate, I think is a very practical step one can take as an individual and as a institution to show care and compassion towards our students. Um, okay, there were some other suggestions yeah. of using email and unzipped um, or zipped files. Um, but something else that came up, um, I mean, we, we are looking at connection and for now, we're focusing on connection with relation to devices and online learning. But what about our care with regards or connection with regards to connecting with our students and what they're going through? I mean, mm -hmm. we as staff have also highlighted and a lot of it's up in, in our chat that um, the things that we go through uh, trying to take care of, of your home and juggle through it um, in this in this new environment in this new setting um, can be stressful and one of the other comments did mention something about an exposure to abuse uh, now that they're away from res and they're now in their home setting it actually exposes a student to abuse and an abusive environment a non-conducive environment to learning so these are also um, concepts and, and, and things that we need to consider when we're talking about connection. Absolutely, um, RT. Um, I'm just m watching the chat here and I see we have quite a few M's. So Showbar wants to say something and then somebody who signed in with a name that begins A0039861. I'm sorry, I don't know who that is. Um, Shobo, if you'd like to go first, and then I'll revert to the other person I mentioned. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Shobo DUT. Um, yes, so I, I feel like um, there is urgency around issues of data and connectivity and uh, devices. Uh, but I think limiting our, con limiting our concern with that will, might put us at risk in terms of the next level of um, engagement and, and, and access. And for me, uh, specifically from a student access uh, perspective, is the whole issue of, um, you know, uh, student epistemological access. So how then do we uh, create spaces, because that is part of caring, uh, mm. is to make them feel part of the meaning-making process. 
um, that they engaging it with them within the module. Now, lots of student um, interventions focuses on literacies, and you would find that in the curriculum conversations, the the notion of how we're going to um, engage in the development of literacy practices seems to be uh, sidetracked uh, uh, by the need to complete the core uh, content of a module. So I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, mm -hmm. The one suggestion I would I would think, of, uh, and, and my colleague Nalini and I were discussing that this morning, was that uh, this is a space, and, and maybe in terms of caring, we should be able to uh, take advantage of uh, print base, but also to take advantage of the possibility of multilingual engagement. Um, and because we're not standing in, in a lecture and lecturing and having to have a common language and all of that, we might have different possibilities to engage with students. So when they are uh, needing to access, it's not just the digital literacy and then compound that with the academic English literate, you know, practices, we actually meet them in terms of uh, linguistic um, uh, challenges that are associated to make meaning a little bit more accessible. So I think that's something we should maybe consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, s s just on that, on that note, I think something that I've seen come through with our students um, is, you know, when students are interacting face to face and they're part of their face to face tutorial groups, very often students are fortunate enough to be engaging with a tutor who speaks their home language. And now with this uh, move to emergency remote teaching, for the most part, everything's being done in English. So not only are we, you know, trying to deal with, as you've just highlighted, um, epistemological access that for many students becomes compounded now because they don't have the interactions with someone, for example, in tutorial groups who can actually speak their home language and help them understand content just a little bit better. So yes, absolutely a fundamental thing that we do need to be paying um, attention to. The other person I referenced who uh, starts, their login name starts with an A, would you like to contribute? Hi, yes, um, and apologies for that. So I'm logged in with my personal number and that's why it's showing us. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so this is Najma from BITS, and uh, we also engaging um, with students, academic advisors, and um, the academics themselves to, to find out what the student barriers are. And um, I posted the comment about the res being a safe space. Um, mm -hmm. I found that quite um, telling of, you know, of what, what stu students um, go through um, in their daily, daily lives. And I think uh, often we, we focus on the survey data um, and the logins and, you know, are we giving them devices? Um, do they have access, that sort of thing? But um, we're not in touch with, um, you know, the, the daily lives and, and the lived experiences, if you want to call it that. Mm. So that's what we're trying to do with, with the dialogues that we're having. And um, pretty much everything that's been mentioned is coming out with, um, you know, um, from, from the dialogue that we have with them. Um, so what was also telling from, from the experiences shared was that students feel that learning has now become hollow. It's, 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 it's meaningless. It's as if you're just sitting, trying to engage with content and um, submitting assignments and assessments. And, and um, the, the joy of learning is just not there anymore. They feel disconnected, they feel overwhelmed. And sometimes, I mean, lecturers, most lecturers are trying to do like really good things, but it's just the enormity, enormity of it and, and, and just getting bombarded from all sides. They're just not coping. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, very, very important point. I think it highlights how, how much learning actually is just very much a social activity. Um, two other people I noticed in the chat, there's um, Darlington and then Zena. if the two of you would like to take the mic, one after each other. Darlington or Zena? Nicola, can I talk? It's Karen. Um, 
Sure. Go, Karen. Karen or Darlington or Zena, do one of you would one of you like to speak? Hello. Yes, I can have a go. Hello, Darlington. Hello. My name is uh, Darlin Hove. I'm from uh, Mango Soto University of uh, Technology. Now, prior to joining uh, Mango Soto, I was working at uh, UNISA as an uh, e-tutor. Now, uh, with what's uh, happening, the, the first uh, transition that's happening in higher education, you know, it brings a lot of what we were doing in the distance learning space onto the contact uh, learning uh, space. Now, I just want to highlight a few issues which we need to be to be careful with in terms of uh, our caring uh, approach. I saw some uh, on the chats, some people were mentioning the issue of uh, zero, I mean, there's a student who mentioned uh, the zero rated sites that they are not uh, zero rated as, as such. No, they are zero rated, that's, that's a fact. But in your uh, creation of the material, if you are going to create something that's going to take an external link, a hyperlink and so on, the moment a student clicks on that hyperlink or goes to some uh, off-site uh, YouTube uh, video, that zero-rated uh, uh, incentive, it, it goes away and then it doesn't uh, serve its purpose. So in a way, that's a restriction in, in itself. And then things like uh, videos and so on, even if the site is zero-rated, you might end up clogging the, the system, you know, the bandwidth and so on. and. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what I thought uh, people should also consider. So everything has to happen on site, which is a serious uh, limitation within where you are working on, within the LMS. And now that also is a major restriction. Not everything happens there. Some things go to Google and so on, and then you, you have to check on uh, other sites and, uh, and so on. You can't cover everything to be in the zero rated. And then there's the issue of uh, text versus verbal communication. Now with uh, online uh, learning, most of the learning is going to be textual and it's not going to be happening uh, like uh, at the same time, you are simultaneously. You know, when we are talking right now, we are giving each other chances. And as we are giving each other chances, if you have noticed, so many chats have been uh, coming in and it only takes, there is a, a limit on which chats you can uh, look at if it really, comes to, to, to that. So it's something also that's a, a limitation that we also need to think about in how we, we work around. There is no spontaneous uh, engagement in uh, online learning, which means we have to adjust our text to make sure that we cover everybody. There, is all, there are always two groups which are easy to identify in um, online learning. There are the lurkers and then there are those who are the movers. The, the students who never participate, they are listening, and then those who dominate uh, everything. So you mm. need to be careful that no one is left uh, behind within mm. that, uh, that, that space. WhatsApp, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a possible item using groups, but uh, also there are also limits. What I would want to think about maybe going forward is, okay, if this corona thing, uh, uh, pandemic goes away, we are 100% free. What should go on in the future? I would want to see a situation of a bit of both. There should be a lot of this online learning remote. And then at some point, maybe once in a while, you get into maybe meeting a class or something and so on, uh, things like that. So that something is learned that we can carry over. Even if things get back to normal, something should be carried over from what's happening now. I think I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Darlington. Nicola, can I say something now? Thank you, Danny. It's Karen. Can you hear me, Nicola? Oh, okay. Go for it, Karen. Can you hear me, Nicola? Hello? Yes, Karen, go for yeah. it. Yeah, I just, I just want to say, I think the, the whole issue of relationality is so key in this. And... Um, I've just, I think we're all trying to connect with our students and other colleagues through different kinds of forums and just having spaces to try and make a kind of collaborative space 
like these ones where you can engage with issues where people can kind of exhale a bit, where we can share and problem solve, where we can show um, aspects of care and concern. And just that, just even the affective sense of being able to hear other voices, see other people. And those are some of the things maybe we privileged to, to be able to sometimes connect online. But I think a lot about, you know, the kind of divisions between our home lives and our either student or professional lives, those boundaries have merged in this lockdown space. And it's sometimes so overwhelming um, to try and kind of hold those spaces. I think you could hear it in the frustration in that student's um, voice was just that just everything is just too much, you know, there's too little and there's too much. Um, so I think that, you know, that just small acts of kindness in, in, a, in a range of ways of, you know, just engaging where one can engage online, just little messages of support, the ongoing links in the communication, helping students to link with each other as well as, so there's the peers and the students wherever we can through WhatsApp. I think a range of ways of keeping those connections going and motivating each other and making the space, not just to talk about what we need to be doing in our lectures, but how we doing. And how are things, how are we feeling? What is happening? Maybe just to check in before we start with a formal agenda. Just those are some of the things that have actually been working in my, in my work at the moment. Thank you for that, uh, Karen. I, I really do agree. I mean, I do think it's very often those small acts of care, of compassion, of kindness that actually stick not only with our colleagues, if it's you know being shown towards colleagues, but really do stick with our students. Um, anybody else want to contribute to the discussion at this point? Zena, you had uh, indicated earlier you wanted to say something. Would you like to come in now? Yes, thanks, thanks, Danny. Um, yeah. Thanks, Karen. I think that was very helpful, and I think that what we need to remember is that they they really aren't any solutions. I think someone said in the chat that there's no one size fits all. Mm. Um, and that's very true of the process that we're going through. So like our st students are experiencing trauma by being displaced, many of them have been sent back home. Um, I think it creates a whole new level of possible disparities that may have been slightly equalized, and I use that uh, term very lightly, um, when they're on campus and so very often students go back home and they, they don't have access to those resources that they would have had had they been on campus and so it's important like Karen just said is to find ways of how we can connect with our students where they could possibly have a space for these kinds of discussions I think to a certain extent it may feel cathartic for us to be engaged with each other and to hear and learn from each other but I think the same needs to be said for or done with our students is to open up those spaces. And it's hard because some of the things that we hear, like we heard in those student voice clips, creates a level of discomfort. But how do we sit with that discomfort and, and what do we need to do to move beyond that discomfort? Because sometimes it's important to recognize that the, those discomforts are, are huge. Um, but, but what can we do? How could we think through that together? And I think that um, that's an important aspect to consider as well. So thank you. That was very useful, Karen. Thank you, Zina. I just want to check in with my co-presenters. Do any of you have, um, at this point, anything further that you want to add? I, um, sorry, I'd like to say something. I think, sure. um, Something that's coming up again in the chat is also the use of um, peer tutors and peer mentors and academic advisors that can actually help bridge that link um, with the students to assist those that are going through difficulty. I think that's a very important point that's actually come up. Um, but in that, uh, they've also mentioned something about a zero rated uh, space that can be used because in my case, I've tried using that or suggesting that with my mentors and they're finding it difficult because our students are not accessible because of WhatsApp and data and things like that. So some of the mentees are participating, some are not, and the reasons are because they're not accessible. So um, 
it's good that we're sharing this because we're all learning from each other. And, and I think that this is such an important space. So yeah, that's just something to add. Thank you, Arti. Um, I am just checking on time. We've got time for maybe one or two more contributions. Um, S. Bishop, would you like to take the mic? Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I am the uh, Intensive English Program Coordinator at Stellenbosch University's Language Centre. And um, the importance of the check-in with your fellow teachers, your, your staff and your colleagues is, is extremely important for us. We have a weekly check-in. And uh, something I ask my teachers every week is um, what unexpected positives have you discovered this week? And that could be absolutely anything. It opens up to all sorts of uh, positives that they've experienced, not just through the curriculum or through their teaching. Um, and something else is just also framing things. Um, be very careful of how you frame things, not saying what was positive or what was negative this week, but perhaps saying um, what went well and what could we improve on and what advice or suggestions would you like to share with your colleagues? So I think it's very important how we frame the way we ask for feedback. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One thing I want to add at this point is everything that has been shared at the moment is incredibly valuable and has hopefully given others some, you know, good tips and tricks, if you will, of things to do moving forward. The one thing that hasn't really been mentioned, and I do want to make sure that it is at least on our radar, is we've tried at UCT to be very mindful of including those members of our staff who work in our disability services offices, office in various conversations, because they are also obviously dealing with a range of student needs around various uh, disabilities or um, differential ways of learning that need to, to be addressed and accommodated as well. Um, and it actually has been incredibly beneficial to have them serve on things like our vulnerable students working group, because not only do they hear from us what's happening across the campus with regards to who's acc accessing uh, courses and such online, but they often have really fantastic ideas in terms of you know, some people in this chat have mentioned universal design for learning, for example, they come with really good ideas um, and small examples of how to really show care and compassion um, in our interactions and in the way we structure our courses, not only um, for how they would use it and share it with students who have disabilities, but actually things that can apply to all students. So certainly is something that I've learned through this pro process is the importance of interacting with and keeping staff who are involved in our disability services office um, involved in important conversations across campus because it has benefits for everyone. Final ask, anybody has any final uh, thoughts that they want to contribute? Otherwise I will move on to closing out the webinar. Any final M's going to appear in the chat? Yes, I have a, um, a suggestion. Go for it, Emmanuel. Hi, uh, I just actually I wrote it in the chat. Uh, my view is that um, my, our students complain a lot about data, even we lecturers, those who don't have access to Wi-Fi at home. So my suggestion is that the, the Minister of Education and also the Vice Chancellors can engage the cell phone companies as um, a form of the social responsibility to have a data package for students, registered students for a year. For example, we can give, okay, you pay about say, 1,000 for a year for educational purposes. And this will eliminate all the data issues so that the student cannot mm -hmm. focus on other things. But if the cell phone companies are not prepared, then I think something must be done. It's very, very important because when I teach my students online, others will join and then we zoom later on, they are short of data and then they have to go back and then it interrupts activities. But I believe strongly that the government must do that. And then, then the cell phone companies will now have some tax reliefs because they do that for students throughout the country. I think will go a long way to eliminate the data cost problems. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Okay, folks, um, by way of trying to... Sorry, Danielle, Danny, yes. may I just um, respond to that? Um, I know that some institutions have, in fact, um, granted these students uh, 30 gigs of data. Um, and this will continue, um, you know, throughout. And what they've done with international students, for example, is because they cannot 
give them the data bundle, what they've actually done is they've mm. put the money into their accounts, uh, which would be the equivalent of data so that they can buy it. So I think there are some institutions who are trying to, um, you know, assist in this regard, um, but obviously it's not all institutions, but there are some that are doing that. And I, I think that's something that all institutions should be considering. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Nelia. That's a good point. And it also reminds me that uh, certainly in my experience at the moment, there are some external bursary providers who are also doing similar initiatives with their students, um, you know, obviously through their own independent means. Um, so yes, absolutely. By way of uh, closing out the webinar, um, I've been trying to pay attention to the chat and pay attention to everything that people have been saying because I wanted to come up with um, hopefully three, maybe four themes that really speak to what we've tried to delve into today. You've heard from students, you've heard from each other, you've heard from those who have been presenting in terms of really trying to understand the current lived experience in this very different space that we are currently living and working in. And there are just a few things I'd like to say. The first is looking at what's come through the chats and looking at what, and listening to what everybody's been saying, learning is very much a social activity. It's very much a social activity for our students. And many of you made comments that ref reflect that, but it's also a, a social activity for us. Many of you have commented either verbally or in the chat, how useful today's uh, space and session has been to simply connect with each other, to share ideas and to share, to, share to share tips with each other. And I think that's fundamentally important. I think it's also fundamentally important too to the comment that was made earlier, wherever you work on campus within your units, it's important for you as staff to be able to connect with each other on a regular basis as well. I mean, we do that in our office in CHED and I'm, I must be honest and say it has actually been incredibly helpful uh, just to know that that we we are all in this together uh, obviously we experience it very differently but that we are showing care and compassion perhaps more than we have ever before to each other um, and the same goes for our students opening up those spaces for them to simply come and talk i mean i know in my own teaching i open up a session on a monday and a thursday evening for my sessions to just come and talk and it doesn't have to be about course content and it's actually a deeply enriching experience because you really do get to start to get a sense of what it is our students are experiencing and what their actual lived experiences are and how much of it resonates with what we are going through. The other thing is I think going through this moment is vitally important and this point was made and I try to keep this as my mantra as I move through the COVID-19 pandemic but is what can we as individuals and what can we as institutions learn and do differently. No doubt, moving to emergency remote teaching has had a lot of challenges, but I think there are also some positives that are starting to emerge from this. And I think as universities, institutions of higher education, I think it would be a lost opportunity if we didn't fundamentally do introspection and say, based on what we've learned and based on what we've experienced in this um, in this moment, what can we bring into our university environment and system that we've done now, but has fundamentally changed how we do things and has improved our systems and processes and has improved the way we interact with, with students, with our colleagues. Um, and to Sue's point as well, is like, how do we build in our own self-care, not only for the work that we do, but particularly also self-care when it comes to working and living in the same space. So I think we really do need to do introspection and say, collectively and individually, what have we learned and what are we learning and what can we do differently moving forward when hopefully in time to come, we do return to face-to-face -face teaching as we know it. And then finally, somebody made this point in the chat is that we do need to be flexible. We need to be flexible in terms of what we are expecting from our students. We need to be flexible in terms of what we're expecting from ourselves and from our colleagues because the lived experience is so very different for every single one of us. And so to ensure that we manage our own expectations and that we manage the expectations of our students is I think one of the fundamental things we need to be practicing at the moment in terms of us showing care um, and compassion and focusing on the relationships we have with our students and with each other. The final thing I want to point you to is um, this will be recorded 
um, and I do believe the chat gets um, saved as well and it will Nicola will make it available on uh, YouTube and on the Haltasa site but I encourage you in particular to look at what's been happening on the chat because there's been some wonderful chat happening in the background and some truly fantastic suggestions have been put forward um, around things to do and things to think about um, moving forward. The very last thing I want to say is here is the contact details of each of us, the seven of us who have been involved in today's uh, webinar, our names, our email addresses, and the uh, collaborative learning community that each of us is affiliated with. And if there's anything you want to reach out about uh, to any one of us, please do. Uh, we would love to hear from you. And I want to thank each of my co-presenters. I want to thank Rita. I want to thank Nicola for your assistance and your introduction. And I also want to thank Haltasa for giving us the space uh, to provide you with the opportunity to pause, to reflect, um, and to collaborate. So thank you all very much. Thank you.